Take a Bible and let's turn together to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. And next week begins our World Missions Month. Our guest speaker next Sunday will be Dr. Daryl Whiteman, anthropologist who is with the Mission Society and uh, coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. And then the week after that, Dr. Chuck White giving us an overview of how the gospel changes all of culture with a case study on William Carey all through the month focusing on missions. Our privilege are participating in the greatest movement in human history. Our missions teams coming back and reporting, and it's a great month, one of my favorite months of the year. Our goal is to interest and inform and involve every man, woman, young person, boy and girl in the world mission movement. And join us in this coming month as we celebrate together what God's doing in the world. But today I'm finishing a three week series on stewardship. Steward means that you're no longer an owner of your stuff. You are a caretaker and uh, you are a caretaker on behalf of the true owner which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what a steward is. And two weeks ago, I began this series and focused on 2 Corinthians 8, this wonderful verse that says, just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in basketball, in scrapbooking, in mathematics, in biology, and in your love for us, see that you excel in this grace of giving. And then last week, I focused on Malachi chapter 3, where God says to the prophet, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room of enough for it. But given a definition of financial freedom, which the world would not resonate with at all, but in Christ it changes everything. Financial freedom, when you're a Christian, is this. It's when I am free to serve God's eternal purposes with my temporary wealth. Not just my money, but my time, my gifts, my talents. I'm free to serve God's eternal purpose. And I gave you four stewardship axioms. Here's the first one. All things belong to God. Secondly, all things come from God. Third, all things will be made new, which means all these things will pass away. Anybody discovered that yet? My stuff will pass away. If you don't believe that, just drive a car in the salty winter Michigan roads, right? It'll pass away. Isn't it discouraging that your car that you're driving will never look as good as it does now? <laughs> Not so discouraging. Stewardship axiom number four. In fact, all of us will never look as good as we do now. That's discouraging. Axiom number four. God will make rich in all things those who are willing to be generous at all times. Generosity is a hallmark characteristic of our God, and it's a characteristic of all of those who claim to be his. Generosity. And our theme this month is generous. And I gave you this resource, which is available to you online. Uh, it is $7. You can download it or you can uh, call and they'll send it to you. 40-day spiritual journey to a generous life. Devotional with full of stories. Here's one story um, that's in this resource of a guy named George who went to hear Dr. Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, went to hear him speak. And Bill Bright challenged this audience. He said, all of you in this audience, I challenge each of you to give $1 million to God's work in the world. Every one of you. Now, Bill Bright's a man of faith. Well, anyway, this George came up to Bill Bright after the session and said, I know you were talking about some of these people because there's some money people in here, but you, you weren't talking to me because I make $50,000 a year. And Bill Bright asked George, well, how much did you give to the Lord last year? And uh, George stood up straight and kind of proud of himself, said, I gave $15,000 to the Lord last year. It's 25% of his income. Thinking Bill Bright would be impressed. Bill Bright wasn't impressed. He said, I would challenge you to ask the Lord to enable you to give $50,000 this year. George says, that's my whole salary. And Bill Bright said, trust the Lord. You own a business, don't you? Yeah. And he explained his business. He said, trust the Lord to enable you to give $50,000 next year. Well, George went home with his wife. He prayed. They prayed together. They dedicated their business, their life to the Lord. 
And they said, Lord, if you'll provide, we'll give you $50,000. Well, a miracle happened. The business improved, and George and his wife lived at the same financial level. Now, how many of you, if your income goes up, you stay at the same lifestyle level? Hard to do, isn't it? Some of you would say, I'd love to try. I'd love to see what that's like. But our human nature is we kind of rise with the water level. If we make more money, we spend more money. But George and his wife didn't. And at the end of that next year, they gave $50,000 to the Lord work. And the year after that, that God blessed their business again. And they gave $100,000 to the Lord's work. And they continued to live at the same financial level. And within five years, George gave a million dollars to the Lord's work. I'd like to try that, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be amazing? To a generous life. Two weeks ago, I introduced you to this article by Walter Brueggemann, and he, he coined this phrase, the myth of scarcity versus the liturgy of abundance. And the myth of scarcity is the world in which we live. It's a world of anxiety, and it's a consumeristic approach to life, and it says that we are in love with more and we never have enough. That's the air in which we breathe. That's the water that we drink. That's the American economic climate. Consumers, we are all, we are in love with more, and we never have enough. The myth is scarcity. And if you don't believe that, just if you follow the markets on any given day, the stock market, commodities market, the markets always vacillate between anxiety, they hit their nose on a wall of anxiety, or they bounce to the other side and hit their nose on a wall of greed, and they go back and forth. And that's the way the economy works. It's a myth of scarcity, and it is an anxious, ridden life. And that's the world in which we live. On the contrast is the gospel, which is a liturgy of abundance that is not based on fear, but that's based on freedom and based on trust and faith in a God who is much bigger than any of us know. And the word liturgy, let me just explain the word liturgy. The lit liturgy means, literally, the work of the people. We think of a worship service where we do a liturgy, uh, here, and that's the, it's called the work of the people. But a liturgy is not what we do in a sanctuary of a church on a Sunday morning. Liturgy is a whole life posture. It's the work of the people. In other words, it is the posture, the pace, and the pattern of our life's work in submission to God, in response to his word, what he has said, and in cooperation with his purposes. Liturgy of abundance is a life given to God in submission to him as Lord in response to what he's promised and in cooperation to what he wants to do in the world. All that I am, all that I possess, all that I can do is a gift from him given to accomplish his purposes, not my purposes, but his purposes in the world through me. And the day when you believe that, the day when I believe that, is the day that you and I will be completely free. We choose either a myth of scarcity or we choose to walk in a liturgy of abundance. Now let's turn to this story and see if you can see the story of abundance in this story in 1 Kings 17. Let me give a little background quickly. This is the 9th century BC. Elijah has been raised up as a prophet during the time of King Ahab who the scripture describes as probably one of the most flagrant violators of God's law as a king of Israel. Ahab set up idols, idol worship, uh, the idol worship that wasn't just worshiping stones and idols, but the gods of fertility, the god of Molech, which means they sacrifice their children to the fire. And if you can just read in chapter 16, the last paragraph, talks about the foundations of the city of Jericho were rebuilt and uh, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, meaning that guy sacrificed his children in order to be successful in building that city of Jericho. This is the kind of stuff that went on. Ahab married a woman named Jezebel, which, by the way, you'll notice that kids who are born, their parents tend not to name them Ahab and don't tend not to name the girls Jezebel. Have you noticed that? She was a wicked woman. She was from a foreign northern territory, and she was responsible for the murder of all the prophets. And Elijah was one of the few guys left, and he was on the run. God spoke through Elijah to Ahab and said, 
there will no longer be any rain, no longer any crops until I say so. Now, that's not a good way to win the favor of the king. And Elijah became a fugitive. In the beginning of chapter 17, how Elijah went and on the run hid out near a brook in the Kareth Ravine, and ravens, wild birds, fed him there. They brought him hamburgers, tacos, stir-fry, and he drank at the brook. And he stayed there until the scripture says the brook dried up after a time, and that takes us to our story. Sometime later the brook dried up, verse 7, because there had been no rain on the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and he asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and, by the way, bring me, please, a piece of bread. She said, as surely as the Lord, look what she said, as the Lord your God lives. She was a foreigner. She was not of the tradition. She wasn't a churchgoer. She didn't know the God of Israel. She said, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour, in a jar and a little oil in a jug and I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and then die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. In other words, Elijah told this woman, make me uh, bread first. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Do you see the liturgy of abundance in that story? So she went away, and she did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Now, in Sunday school, you've heard that story, and that's kind of the way you see the story, right? It's a beautiful story of God's love for a woman and her son. But I need to tell you that that's probably not what the story looked like. The story looked more like this. A woman who is running out of food in a famine where many, many people were dying. And we recognize that picture. She was a widow. Estimates are today in the world there are 245 million widows in the world. 117 or 115 million of those widows live in abject poverty, meaning they live on less than a dollar a day because of war, tribal violence, and AIDS. As in Elijah's day is true today in many parts of the world, widows have no property, no legal rights. They often are blamed by the husband's family for the husband's death, accused of poisoning him, especially if there was AIDS. And you and I know the science of AIDS. AIDS happens because a husband was probably sexually active and unfaithful to his wife, and yet in many cultures still, the widow is blamed, ostracized, stigmatized, punished. Some cultures require her to have sex with somebody in the town in order to purge her of the evil. All kinds of unspeakable things. In India and in Bangladesh, the vernacular words for widow means prostitute, sorceress, or witch. What happened to our... I can't preach if we don't have... There it is. And Elijah comes to this widow who's dying and says, feed me first. What kind of God would do that? How cruel must God be? 
Amazing story. Jesus' words that you heard early in the service, John chapter 15, where Jesus said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's a promise of abundance. And I don't know if that word struck with you this morning as it has for me for years. I've been confounded by that word of Christ. Whatever you ask for in my name, it will be done for you. I've asked for a lot of things and God hasn't given to me. I remember as a kid, I prayed to be invisible. I did for a long time. Now, those psychotherapists out there try to figure that one out. I'm glad God did not grant that prayer. Have you heard about the invisible man who met the invisible woman and they fell in love and got married? They had a wonderful marriage, but the kids were nothing to look at. I'm glad God has not answered all my prayers. So I look at Jesus in John 15. I say, what's that about? There's something about that, and there's that qualifier. If, if my words remain in you and you remain in me, Ask anything in my name. It's a wonderful story of Dr. Helen Rosevear, who is a missionary doctor in the, what is now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. She was there in the 50s and 60s. If you know anything about the history of uh, Central Africa, the wars and rebellion, throwing off the yoke of Belgian uh, rule, Many, many people were killed. Many Europeans were killed. Many missionaries were killed in those days. She was brutalized in the early 60s by uh, Congolese rebels. But her amazing story, one story she's very well known that she told about, uh, as a medical doctor, she was helping deliver a baby of a mother. The labor was going very difficult, and she worked hard and prayed hard to save the mother's life, but she couldn't. The mother died. But the baby barely survived. And they had to do all they could with limited resources in the middle of the Congo, in the bush, to save this child's life. There was a two-year-old little girl that survived. So there's now two orphans of this little, this dead woman. And uh, Dr. Helen quickly asked her nurse, they had one warm hot water bag. It's a rubber bag that we filled with hot water. She said, quickly, go get that, and we'll wrap it in a blanket and put the baby in there to keep it warm. They were on the equator, but the nights were still cold. The nurse went, came back five minutes later. Her face was just ashen. She said, I filled the, wa- the bag with hot water, and it burst. Limited resources. You know, things break. What do we do? They quickly build a fire, and they had a nurse lay next to the baby, blocking the wind by the door and sitting as close to the fire as possible. The baby miraculously survived through the night. The next morning, Helen was meeting with some school children, and she referred to them as their prayer time about this little baby that was hanging on for life. And she said, let's pray for the baby. And as they prayed, a 10-year-old little girl prayed this prayer. She said, God, bring a hot water bag today. It can't be tonight. It has to be this afternoon because tonight the baby will be dead. And while you're at it, Bring a dolly for the two-year-old sister. Amen. And Helen was sitting there thinking, oh, such faith. What disappointment. She, there's no water bottle in the bush in the Congo. And Helen Rosevere had been there four years. She said, I had never yet received a parcel from anywhere. But at noon that day, a truck pulled up a messenger hopped out and left a 22-kilo package at the hospital. Dr. Helen and all these kids, excited kids, went out to see what was in that box. They opened it. There were bandages, medical supplies. They dug down to the bottom, and wouldn't you know, at the bottom of that box was a hot water bag. And that 10-year-old little girl made her way through the crowd, and she said, if there's a hot water bag in there, there's got to be a dolly somewhere. And they dug deeper, and sure enough, there was a doll in the bottom of that box. That box was packed five months earlier and came from Ireland, Helen Rosevere's home church. Somebody, five months earlier, was prompted, commanded by God, you better put a hot water bag in there, and by the way, throw in a dolly.
we only know the myth of scarcity. But the least in the world know something about the gospel of abundance. I've been reading the narratives of George Mueller. I've been sharing this with my board and with the staff the last week or two. Here's a picture of him, isn't he? Don't you just want to, he should be Santa Claus. Look at that guy. I mean, there's not a mean bone in that body. He, Bristol, England in the 19th century, felt led by God to establish an orphanage, noticing many, many children without parents. By the time he died, he had housed and fed 10,000 plus orphans. He also had scripture track society and he funded missionaries and he also built 117 schools and educated 120,000 children in the 19th century Bristol, England. And he never once asked anybody for a penny. He said for the purpose of giving testimony to God's provision, his liturgy of abundance. He didn't use those words, but you get the idea. And there's, if you read, I'd recommend it. On Kindle, it's free. The Narratives of George Mueller. Download it, read it. Story after story of God's provision. Never unloading the truck, but always enough for each day. Story of one morning, they came down for breakfast. They were completely out of money. There was no food in the orphanage house. And they gathered at the table, empty plates, and George Mueller didn't know what to do, but he trusted God. He said, children, let's pray for God's provision. Let's thank God for what he's about to provide. And before they said amen, there was a knock on the door. It was the baker who told them, I got up at 2 o'clock in the morning. My heart was heavy, and God told me to bake bread for you today. And as they were unloading the bread truck, another knock on the door. It was the milk peddler whose cart broke down at the front door right in front of the orphanage, and so they had milk and bread for the day. Stories like that. Isn't that amazing? But what most interested me about George Mueller's narratives was he wrote down for me and for you what he called five rules or five um, conditions of prevailing prayer. Answers to prayer from George Mueller's narratives. Five conditions of prevailing prayer. And as I read those, I was astounded by them because I saw for the first time the clearest expression of what I believe Jesus had in mind in John chapter 15. Remain in me and my words remain in you and ask whatever you wish in my name and it will be done for you. George Mueller, a lifelong lessons. And anybody that has that prays like that, I want to pay attention, don't you? Here are the five conditions of prevailing prayer in his language. Number one. Entire dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the only ground of any claim for blessing. In other words, he had to quiet himself and all the voices and all the anxiety and focus in every prayer time on Jesus Christ as being the Lord and the Savior. Spiritual battle, first step. The second thing he said was separation from all known sin. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. Now, Mueller became well-known in England, and he fought constantly with the battle for pride and ego. Look what I've done for the Lord. And in his prayer time, focusing on Jesus, cleansing himself of any sin of pride in his prayer time, lest the Lord would not answer. The third thing he said was faith in God's word of promise as confirmed by his oath. Not to believe him is to make him both a liar and a perjurer. He had to hone in on belief in Christ. The fourth thing was he said, I have to ask according to his will. Our motives must be to serve God's purposes. We must not seek any gift of God to consume it upon our lusts for our desires. What he was saying was, it is so tempting to pray for that which I think I need. In fact, there's many TV preachers today who will tell you if you give to God, God will return a hundredfold to you. And that's it. But the implication is it's there to bless you, it's there to make you wealthy and comfortable. That's the lie. 
George Mueller says, the key to prevailing prayer is that my whole life is given not for my desires, my comfort, my agenda, but it's given for his purposes. That's a huge thing. And you can see how these, four, these first four steps of prayer took time, took time. And then the fifth one is this, perseverance in our asking. There must be waiting on God and waiting for God. We must not seek any gift of, I mean, as the, the farmer has long patience to wait for the harvest. Sometimes God answered the last minute. What a powerful five steps of prevailing prayer. George Mueller said, I never rushed into prayer for a thing. But I first searched the scriptures, searched my heart, went through those five steps of purging himself of any ulterior motives, of any sin, in order to focus on faith in Christ, in order to discern the purposes of God. And once he had done that, then he said, I went to prayer and I asked. Now, all my life, I've been quick to ask. Lord, give me an A on that test. Anybody? Anybody? Help that girl to like me. That was before I was married. Quick to ask. George Mueller said, I was slow to ask until I had worked through these steps. And then he said a powerful thing. And once I was ready, once I asked, I fully believed God would answer every prayer. And he did. Isn't that amazing? Five steps of prevailing prayer. And a guy like that, with a testimony like that, I want to sit up and take notice. The liturgy of abundance is only discovered by those who believe in Christ and those who surrender all to Christ and who posture their life for the purposes of Christ. And you don't need to run an orphanage to do that. You don't need to be a preacher or a missionary to do that. You need to do that if you're a business owner or a school teacher or a stay-at-home mom or a retiree. All of us are called to a posture, a liturgy of abundance. You believe that? Very different from what you hear many preachers say. Don't hear me say what many preachers are saying. What kind of God would go to a foreign land? Jesus himself said in the days of Elijah, uh, God sent Elijah not to a churchgoer, not to one of the insiders, but he sent her to a widow in the northern region of Sidon. What kind of God would go there, and not only there, but he would go to bless a woman who's on the margins of society? What kind of God would do that? This, this God would. What kind of God would go to a starving, dying woman and say, feed me first? This God would. But what kind of God could provide daily needs, daily abundance, until the famine is over? This God can. And he does. The liturgy of abundance, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples.